What's going on everybody, LK here. Today, we're going to talk about beginner mistakes that people make in Guilty Gear Strive. So specifically, I got five here listed. I'm gonna tell you why it's a mistake and what you can do about it. So the first one would be mashing throw on wake up. So why is this not such a great tactic? So in classic Guilty Gear, this was also a very strong tactic, but the difference is in this game, when you throw, there's a throw with animation, where in classic Guilty Gear, you will generally either mash a 5H, or if you're doing a special input, so they have like a throw option select, where you can throw and do another button at the same time by pressing another button and either forward or back in H at the same time. Generally forward, you could get either this or this, and if they were next to you, you would actually throw them. So in Classic Guilty Gear, you don't have a throw button. Your throw button is on one button, generally heavy slash. So when I'm next to somebody, I'll get throw when I'm in throw range. However, when I'm not in throw range, I'll get this. This leads to some unique situations where you're able to throw and do a reversal button. Generally, ones that people would use is things like 6P. So with the same input, with characters like Johnny, they might use this, which gives you throw point blank. The throws are also faster in this game than Strive. In this game, throws are one frame, where Strive it is two. So in Strive, if you get a throw, you're in a pretty good spot, especially if you're using it like, like a back throw, like you got a successful back throw. Now, the main issues of wake up throw in this game is one, it is a throw. So when you with this when someone is just slightly out of range you're not going to get 6p you're not going to get your very fast 5h if you have one like that you're going to just throw which makes the throw much more committal in most situations the other thing is that it's two frames now so you're basically hoping your opponent is messing up which personally i do not recommend that you hope your opponent makes a mistake in like 98 percent of situations so because it's slower that means it is much more reliable to get in someone's face and hit them with an attack that is placed on them when you wake up every character in this game has a recommended throw like anti-throw that they can do in my opinion so for example biken biken has a couple uh, a nice easy one is 6k why 6k? Because 6k is active for 9 frames, so it's really, really hard to mess this up. This move is actually my go-to in this situation. On top of that, if you meet it properly, it's plus, which is very nice. Another option she has is to Yozansen. Yes, the instant overhead, which puts you off the ground, so you either overhead them or you hit their throw. Not to say that you can't use wake up throw, you should just be very careful and assume your opponent is prepared for it. The main time I would introduce wake up throw as an option would be if the opponent did something like this. If they're trying to do like these type of games where they're trying to either throw you when you get up or they're trying to either do this or they're trying to do this. Trying to do like a kind of like a fake air dash setup into low. That's another good spot to do it. Uh, if they look like they're doing a weird left right, let's say go up here or something. That's another good place to try to do it. Or if they are hitting you from really really far and you don't think they'll make it in time. So, so I can say something like this. Yeah, I think, I think it's good though. Say something like this. Man, bike in. <laughs> Wait, this is not a great example. Just, just showing that like someone running up on you off of, like a soft knockdown or some weird random hit might be a good time to attempt it. Big mistake number two, mashing on plus frame. So this means in situations where your opponent is advantageous, you still try to counterattack. Something like this. Now, if you're new to the game 
this can be kind of hard because at this point right now, what, we're at 20 characters, I think, and everyone has different frame data. However, there are a couple of general situations where I would generally not recommend to counterattack. One would be after a deep jump in. Well, one would be after a deep jump in like this. The jump in gives them plenty of time to follow up to the point to the point where to the point where even something like this is okay, like a small dash up is okay. Another spot where the opponent is almost always advantageous is when they do close slash. Uh, almost every character in the game has a plus unblock close slash right now. Some characters like Mei and Giovanna have plus three close slashes. Nako has one as well. Soul has one as well. Uh, the majority of the, of the cast, so Biken, Leo White Fang, um, Zato, Nelia, they have plus one on block close slashes. And then there's the rare Axel Faust who has a minus one on block close slash. But in general, if you block a close slash, you should assume your opponent is advantageous and they're going to enforce it as such. Over time, you will learn when characters are advantageous, when characters are not advantageous, and where there are spots where you can play a guessing game of can you escape or not. However, I think these two spots, you should try to not counterattack. If you want to reduce the chance of your opponent having strong offense in this situation, for example, close slash, my recommendation is to stand FD. So here, he's in close slash, close slash. So if I, let me use like this button. Uh, no, so he's doing close slash, close slash. So what this does is once he's established the respect of, oh, if I do close slash into like 5K or something, then I'm gonna hit you. They'll start adding this to their layer. So if you try to delay, if you try to delay your attack a little bit, bad at this game <laughs> if you try to delay your attack too much you can get hit or trade or something now if you don't want to play this guessing game at all you can try to stand fd we stand up specifically because it pushes back further than the crouch fd so you can see how he's a little bit closer here right here he's just a pinch further the third one is baiting burst too hard so this is going to be talking about like burst meta and how you should be thinking about bursting a little bit in the game. So there are going to be examples where... And people will sit here and wait. Or another example would be something like this that people tend to do. So. If you bait a burst, you get a pretty high return, right? So not only, oh, we need the burst not be infinite. Let's engage. Okay. So not only is the opponent airborne, but their burst gauge is totally empty as opposed to the burst icon being filled about like a little over 20%. So the burst being successful is a big deal because you get a knockdown off it. So the burst being successful is a big deal because you get a knockdown off it. Many characters can follow this up with safe offense. If a character is trying to escape the corner and the person who's attacking burst, they get to resume their office again for the cost of the burst. There are also some characters who, if they get hit here, they can safely start their offense even from here. Well, this situation is a little bit tricky because your back's to the wall. In many situations, you want in many situations, you want to be comfortable with them bursting you. The main thing is, in a situation like this, If the opponent doesn't burst, you're also even. As in, if you sit here and wait, you and your opponent are literally even. And now you're in a scramble situation where you either would have just gotten a combo if they chose not to burst, 
or you would have gotten bursted and then you can just resume playing the game normally. In my opinion, this second example, uh, in my opinion, this second example, uh, wait, how did I do this? <laughs> oh yeah. In my opinion, this second example, is a much, much better burst bait than the first one. And the difference is where the opponent is, where, sorry. The difference is where the opponent is when they burst. So in this case, here you get to follow up your offense safely because you can't air tech in this game, unlike old Guilty Gear games. So the opponent will fall to the ground. So you're able to actually keep your offense in this situation compared to the first situation here where they are not airborne. So you are giving up your offense to do this. Then another factor is where are you in the match? So the first round it could be a pretty competitive round. Uh, however, if you win the first round in a second round, you have a round to lose, right? Where your opponent does not. If your opponent loses that second round, then the game is over. So in the second round, you may not necessarily have to burst in that round. So if you have an opponent that's trying to take your burst multiple times in that round, they're giving up multiple opportunities for like guaranteed offense, big damage combos, things like that. If you're extremely hungry, for bursts, it is worth learning burst safe combos. This is a very character specific, situation specific type of thing, but I feel like this is a much better way of dealing with bursts for the most part than going for hard reads. But if you are going to choose to go for the hard read, at least do it when the opponent is already airborne so that you don't give up your offense. Number four is backdashing, and this is one that applies to every single player of this game, even top players of the game, uh, sometimes fold to this. So the thing is, this game has a dash macro, so you have one button that does dash and backdash for you, and because of that, people be mashing on backdash, and this kind of can get you killed sometimes. I make this mistake, I have to constantly tell myself to hold my ground, don't press backdash, because it's, it's just too good. The main thing about the backdashes in this game compared to previous Guilty Gear games is that the invincibility is homogenized. So you either have a four, five, or six frame backdash. Both these characters have five frame backdashes. And when I say four, five, and six frame, I mean, that's how much invincibility you have as opposed to previous Guilty Gear where the invincibility was honestly pretty, pretty wild. Like <laughs> the backdashes were definitely better in the older Guilty Gear games, but you had to manually do it. You had to do this. Uh, and depending on the situation and what was coming your way, it could be pretty difficult to do as opposed to just pressing the button. So I do think them switching it to this four, five or six frame invincibility system was a good way to compensate for how strong backdash is in this game. But relying on it too much as a defensive option will definitely get you killed sometimes. This applies to everybody who plays the game, by the way. And then the fifth and final one is autopiloting neutral uh, <clears throat> the last one is autopiloting neutral sequences okay so what does that mean autopilot gets a bad reputation in fighting games it has this uh connotation of you're not thinking you're just doing the thing that your character would do uh but there are good parts of autopilot basically like if you have like a response that you can activate really quickly like like you in your brain can just switch on in a situation that's a really good thing so an, an example of like picking a good autopilot option for me would be so an example for me would be how i deal with kyle here so when i block food arc when I block food arc, I stand block and mash, like guarantee, I, I will do it. That is my autopilot response. I do that immediately on site when I see that. 
that is a good thing. It's hard for him to deal with this. He has to either take a huge risk, like DP after food arc, it's crazy risk. He has to backdash, in which case I have, uh, I'm like plus five or plus six ad advantage. I can like press a button before him, or he has to gamble there. Again, a disadvantage gamble. He has to sit there and do nothing, which also sucks. Like he, he it's a tough spot for him if I choose to pick 5p every single time, right? And I'm able to do it quickly because I do it so much. However, however, there are examples of neutral sequences that people tend to autopilot. So on Biken, I'm sure everyone who plays this game knows for sure it's using IADJS. Everyone is prepared for it. Every everyone is prepared for it because of how strong it is and how much Biken players tend to default to the option. Kyle is another one. He has a bunch of examples, generally around things like Stun Edge and then following up right away on some Dragon Ball energy, cheating the Stun Edge that can assist. Of course, the Stun Edge is advantageous and you're in shock state. So, and <clears throat> of course the Stun Edge is advantageous and you're in shock state. So if he gets you to block this, he is plus. And if he hits you, he gets a combo and it chases jumps and it goes over lows. I know it has a huge, huge, huge laundry list of stuff that's good about it. However, defaulting to it too much leads to people waiting for these things and waiting to punish you. So how do we adjust for this? When we get the situation that we know that people tend to look for really hard, stun edge here or me standing at this range, Biken standing at this range means she's an IADJS range. Honestly, Biken standing at this range means she's an IADJS range. However, when we are in these situations, we don't give the opponent what they're looking for. That's a pretty, be <laughs> that's a pretty basic way of thinking about it, right? So for Biken, rather than using IDGS, why not use Kabadi and, and threaten the space? Why not dash up a little bit? Why not neutral jump and see what the opponent does? In Kyle's case, if you block this, why not pull up a little bit, see what the opponent does? Why not pull up and press a normal, like 6H or something? By having multiple options in a situation where an opponent is prepared for only one thing, you can make it much harder for them to cover the spread, which lets you introduce the option that they were looking for originally. But yeah, hopefully that stuff helped. Uh, these are things that I've seen quite a bit uh, from new players, both from watching them and then playing them. When I play in the tower, I play literally everybody. Like anyone who pulls up, I will play. Even if you play a character I dislike, I'll, I will play you. As usual, if you guys have any questions or comments, feel free to leave them in the comment section below. Like and subscribe if you guys feel like it, and we'll see y'all next time. Peace out.